Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about empowering your practice through myopia management. I'll be your host, Matt Young, and I'm CEO of Media Mice, which is an eye care media company. Today, we have Dr. Cheryl Lee and Dr. Oliver Wu. Cheryl brings with her more than 20 years of international experience in the field of ophthalmology. She was inducted into the Straits Times Hall of Fame in 2015 for expertise in vision care and eye diseases. And she's on the expert panel for the implantable contact lens or ICL. She has developed the number one implantable contact lens center in Southeast Asia. Dr. Oliver Wu also joins us. He is an orthokeratologist, myopia management consultant, and has graduated from the School of Optometry in the University of New South Wales, Australia in 1994 and established an independent optometrist practice in Sydney, Australia, ever since 1997. His special interests are pediatric optometry, myopia prevention, and control contact lens fitting with orthokeratology and specialty contact lenses. He also works in clinical advisory for the Myopia Management Contact Lens Department of Singapore National Eye Center. Cheryl, Oliver, welcome to the program. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. Well, guys, without further ado, we're going to jump into the first topic of the day, myopia clinic setup. And my first question is, how can eye care professionals best prepare to introduce a new specialty like myopia management to their practice? And I'd like to go with you first, Cheryl. I think to start off with, one must have a real interest uh, in children. Uh, an interest in prevention of diseases, as opposed to just treating a problem when it arises. So I think we're used to that in, say, in, di in, in colorectal cancer, for example, we're talking about prevention of diseases, but we've not really talked about prevention of eye diseases. Uh, for the many conferences uh, you've, you've, you've uh, chaired, Matt, we've always talked about glaucoma surgeries, cataract surgeries, but we've never talked about prevention. Mm, so right. this is really a different mindset. Uh, and frankly, I think that the optometrists uh, would be the first port of call for many uh, parents uh, when their children complain that they can't see clearly. And so I think that would be the first, I think, a wake-up call that, one, there has to be an awareness that children do develop uh, myopia at a very young age and then after which uh, later we can talk about uh, having the weaponry within the practice of creating awareness and educating parents to myopia. Yeah I think from an optometrist perspective mm -hmm. is uh, like number one we have to have the passions in market management mm -hmm. like uh, you have to have uh, you love to have to do, love to deal with kids because Kids are very different. You have to have patience about doing with kids and you have to educate them I and mean, prepare yourself in different knowledge, skills and technique, how to manage the myopia properly as well. Like Cheryl, I think you are a surgeon, you do a lot of operation on people's yeah. eyes, isn't it? Like cataract surgery, retinal surgery, all the things. And you have uh, kids of 10 years of age, isn't it? How does it change your mindset? Yeah. Like as a surgeon in change your way to do myopia management. Yeah, so I think, no, I think Oliver is absolutely correct. And yeah. I'm hoping that this would either reach out to optometrists who have young children. Um, and if your children are big, then this is kind of like uh, trying to recall to when you, when your kids were younger. So I spend all of my training, um, really the formative years, perfecting things like cataract surgeries, like cataract surgery, retinal surgery, again, back to treating problems. And I only became interested in myopia control when I was pregnant. So Mark is uh, seven years old. He's like the model on the, on the website. Uh, and the reason being that that was when I started like all, like all mothers, when you're pregnant, you start reading about what's the best milk formula, uh, <laughs> you know, whether you should be co-sleeping or not. And that's when I started being aware that myopia is rampant. If we look at the Asian population looking specifically in Singapore, 
at least three out of 10 children at the age of seven need glasses to see far. That is an astonishing number, right? And if I had not known this, I would not have also looked into preventative measures. So that means uh, what I would do as a mum. So all that led to my, if you would like, interest. I wouldn't say passion. In the beginning, it sounds more like concern and worry that my child would become myopic. Mm. And so Mm. that becomes the next step because when we see a child and Oliver and I have the same frustration, like when you see a child and you you feel pain, you feel regret and being empathetic and more and more moms cry than dads and moms somehow blame themselves for everything. When the child has my, is picked up with myopia, but later on, or, or at a higher myopia, we we live with this guilt. I think that's why optometrists is, uh, I like to share, Dr. Cheryl Lee said, is we are more on the front line to do a lot of uh, screening, communication. We can see a lot of myopia kids in the early stage. That's why... Mm-hmm. For optometrists, we need to prepare ourselves, understand what's the reasons why the kids become myopia or anything that we can do it in the more early stage. What we always talk about is early interventions. So with uh, lots of uh, equipment, knowledge, skills that we need to prepare ourselves. That we will talk about this later, mm-hmm. isn't it, Cheryl? Yep. Now, I heard you guys uh, had a nice little tour recently of Cheryl's clinic where she's focused on myopia management. So uh, I'd like to play that clip for a moment and let everyone take a look. Great. Love that music. So hip. You guys uh, look really hip together over there. We, so. should, we should dance when we're doing it, isn't it? <laughs> the only part that was missing, you know, but, you know, it looked great. And, you know, I got a follow up question from that, too, which is, um, you know, what types of devices, instruments or products, for example, ortho K lenses are required? We saw a bit of ortho K there, I think. But uh, could you explain a little bit further, Cheryl? I think what is important without, uh, at the forefront, I think what is important is myopia control. All these other things are diagnostic, they help, right? So that perhaps is important in the follow-up. And that would be, of course, having uh, an optometrist who is good with children, who can refract So that means get a a good prescription um, of the glasses because we're talking about progression of myopia. So that means picking up small increases in the prescription. Uh, The other one would be the, the, the axial length. So we're correlating the length of the eyeball with the level of myopia. The longer the eye, the higher the myopia. So it would be 
much better if we could have the instruments that would be able to measure the prescription as well as the axial length. So I think that's the, the, the bare minimum in terms of diagnosis and monitoring of progression. And that's a great segue, Cheryl, because uh, the next topic we're getting into is the myopia management best practices. Um, how would you say that myopia progression is best measured, Oliver? I think we the best um, measurements we, we monitor or to manage myopia is by biometry machines. So we have to look at how the eye size change. And then next thing, we also look at the, uh, the prescription like a diopters. So I think um, by looking at the excellent changes, uh, we know what's the management options or plan we need to do or any modifications, especially doing all the aftercare uh, appointment. And like Dr. Cheryl Lee said about the strong correlation between the diopters mm -hmm. and the millimeters, that are the really strong correlations about that. And we knew, and we had a lot of experience, a lot of study told us, uh, there are a lot of great products available in the market. They're really great in managing myopia, uh, managing the diopter, diopter, at the same time, managing the axial length, which is the millimeters. That is something, uh, it's really important equipment for us to managing myopia uh, effectively and with safety as well. And as far as measuring myopia in children or even uncooperative patients, do you have any, do you have any tips for us, Cheryl? The I think in every country, uh, it's managed a little bit differently. So in Singapore, the, the refraction is largely done by optometrists. So I'm like the person at the back who does this, the, the, the kind of the jumping and the dancing and the clowning uh, to distract the child or entertain the child, whatever that's called. But the real person who does the, uh, the refraction, who knows all the tricks would probably would be not probably would be the optometrist so i have to pass the question on to oliver great like we like but like we like like a partnership we work together okay optometrists like dancing together <laughs> like optometrists how we like to make the kids cooperative probably number one we have to make sure the kids trust us okay mm. we have to be kids friendly okay and we sometimes we have to make ourselves become uh, like little clang it's like my practice I always have a big hand okay at 1000 chop chop we try to bribe the kids before they do the <laughs> excellent change chocolate as well when easter coming the kids always with uh, bags of uh easter egg before they come into my my, my before we do the measurement okay when right. they finish they have another bag <laughs> So make the kids trust you and think about is all this test is not painful because other kids were mm. concerned about does it hurt, does it hurt? I think it's not hurting. It's it's something that really quick and simple, easy. So, I mean, building a trust between the kids and make them feel comfortable, I think is really important. Yeah, I've actually had a photo of one child helping another child through, hmm. uh, uh, you know, like one boy was really scared. And the other boy had had been to the clinic many times before and they don't know each other. So I got the bigger boy to hold the hand of the little boy and just sit him through an axle length measurement. He mm. even helped the boy through the refraction. So that's also rather interesting because I think you, if you have children, you realize that, right? You get courage from another kid. So you got some apprentice <laughs> from young, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> right. So sometimes my son comes to the clinic and he talks to the kids about eye break time. Oh, that's great. So I have, I get a little bit of child labor, you know? Yeah, wow. I think sometimes oh, yeah. one good thing is, uh, that's one of my clinics uh, happening is uh, when the kids come up from the consultation room, the see and the kids, we knew the kids are coming for what uh, reason. Yeah. Then I would ask that the, my last patient and, hey, can you share a little bit yes. with that little kids going to come into the room? And that's some positive reinforcement yeah. for the kid, the kid really comfortable to do it. You know, I'm also interested in some tips on communicating treatment strategies with patients and caregivers. You know, so how can you really make your diagnosis easy to understand? I think I, I, I share with me, share know about more interesting way to tell the kids about uh, how to manage myopia. Myopia, what we said before, is an excellent problem. The longer the, I mean, the more higher prescription, which in the longer the eyeball. A lot of time, parents don't understand what mean by longer eyeball. Okay, this is how we're going to show you how to uh, 
okay. tell the parents about what Here is minus go. two. A surgeon goes to operate on my eye. So this okay. is this is all of us, okay? So I I I I'm the support actress, right? So this is the balloon, and this is minus two, so two hundred degrees. So it's this long, right? Okay. And now this is four hundred, so it's doubled, and then it's six hundred. It's getting bigger, and then finally it's minus eight or eight hundred, and this is gonna happen. Whoa. <laughs> so, this is some really good analogy to tell the parent is if we don't manage your kid's eye, mm. that's going to happen in the future. That's the parents will really understand is not the diopter's issue now. It's the size of the eyeball. So then the, the size of the eyeball problem, we know it's a lot of problem. Then I would to see Dr. Shirley <laughs> for fix the problem of the eye. So, yeah. So this is all of us. Uh, very dramatic way of uh, explaining. I should try the that. Kids love it. Yes, I should try. I should try this next time. We, we um, love it here. So I, I, I should that. mention that that Oliver got even a little uh, a speck of that on his glasses. So wow, uh, there so you good. go. There you so go. It's so Small dramatic. Problem. There you yeah. go. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So I don't have balloons. Uh, uh -huh. I should try that. I think yeah. Uh, so. I, I did not bring this. I should be more prepared, but we have uh, an eyeball, a model uh -huh. of an eyeball. And uh, it's the same thing that I do every day. So it's, it's, it's kind of rehearsed to a timing already. I like to talk to the child as opposed to the parent. Uh, and I would ask uh, where the front of the eye is, where the back of the eye is, what, which, what is the length of the eye? And I compare that with the height of a child. Yeah. So really what, what I would like to do is two things for the child. One would be to make sure the child continues to see well. And mm -hmm. the other one is to make sure the eye doesn't grow any longer. So it's mm -hmm. very much like I tell the child, it's like I'm trying to make sure you don't grow any taller. Mm -hmm. But, and then the parents would ask, can you make the myopia better? Can we reverse it? So the answer is no, very much like the height. I cannot make the child any shorter. Yes, right. so True. that they understand. And I will also ask the child why we would need or want to control the myopia. Because what I worry about is that they don't really understand the reason to why we're putting, we're going through all this effort. And I'll tell the child, it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of effort to come to the clinic every three months. And if it's just to say your myopia is increased and we just need to change your glasses, then we've lost the aim to myopia control. So the analogy for me is to say to the child, it's a bit like being fat, right? Is it good or is it not so good to be fat. And so we've correlated that with obesity. Hmm. And the child understands that because you, I'd ask the child, do you think it's good or not so good to be fat? And oftentimes the answer is, oh, my fat friend runs slower. <laughs> so they have this understanding that it's not as healthy, right? Hmm. And so the same thing with the eye, because whether we like it or not, I think we can, we can, we can make it sound good, but we shall not. Myopia is a disease and disease means that it is sight threatening. Right. So what we're trying right. to do here is we must not go away thinking that our aim is to get everyone or make everyone perfect sighted because it's impossible, right? Because honestly, even I have given up for my own son. He at the moment does not wear glasses, but I'm saying myopia, I've heard this before from Hamish, it's a lifestyle disease. They're on handphones, they've got iPads in school, they've got laptops. And this myopia is sadly almost inevitable. But the question is, how low can we go? It sounds like limbo. Like how low can we keep the myopia? Because the lower the myopia, in other words, the shorter the eyeball, the lesser the risk, the lower the risk of a sight-threatening disease, which could be glaucoma, yes, cataracts, true retinal detachments, floaters. So we are really talking about screening and disease prevention. Because by the time you have a disease, you can see me. 
right? But mm. before that, mm. the optometrist should be working as a first line to prevent problems because otherwise we're no better than we were 20 years ago. So I think that's why routine eye examination is really important. Yeah, I think routine eye examination is really important is we don't want they have more problems, isn't it, before we need to uh, do a lot of treatment. So that's mm -hmm. why uh, uh, prevention is really important. Uh, communication is very important mm -hmm. for us between the parents and the kids. Like for example, yeah. obesity, make sure that lifestyle changes and we have to make sure they understand this is not a refractive issue, it's an axomyopia. Yes. So something to do with the health of the eyes, not just the prescription of glasses, you can see better just by getting a stronger glasses. Yeah, I think that's a lot of thing that we need to learn to, uh, from each other about the parents mm -hmm. and understanding about lifestyle as well. Now, Oliver, you mentioned that's... treatment a moment ago, um, mm -hmm. and, and we've talked a lot about explaining myopia, uh, myopia control, but in terms of the main methods or treatments used, what would you guys say is are the main ones to focus on? I think that, I think the first thing is we all agree is we make sure the kids can see clear first. Mm -hmm. Okay, without seeing clear, they will affect a lot of things. And then next part will be the treatment option. Um, it depends on the lifestyles, okay, and the okay. kids. Uh, I mean, the readiness for, like, for example, they're ready for have contact lens on their eye, or they are not ready, and we have glasses, ophthalmic glasses, which has, have special uh, features for myopic management. So a lot of time we need to understand the kid lifestyle mm -hmm. and the parent's preference so we can offer them uh, options. But this option need to review regularly. So maybe they may need to have some extra, uh, op, uh, extra like uh, sometimes we talk about cocktail treatment, mm -hmm. like combined treatment. So that's why regular eye examinations, measurements of all the data will help us to judge, to verify the day one options is appropriate or enough or not enough that we need to modify. You know, and the next topic that we're getting into gets to a bit more detail in this matter. So we're really going to be talking about showcasing the equipment and evidence-based treatment modalities if possible. So, you know, in your practice, what equipment is used in patients' myopia assessment? And perhaps we can start with you, Cheryl. In terms of the assessment of myopia, or rather, rather maybe the severity of, of the myopia, so of course, one is the refraction, and then after which, uh, which correlates very well with the axial length. So mm. I think these two would be, the, 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 would be ideal uh, for any clinic uh, to have. And the other thing, I suppose we shouldn't call them equipment, but staff. So you mm. do need staff who are good with children. Uh, children pick up vibes quite quickly to whether they, yeah. they like someone and they can tell if the optometrist or the, the doctor is uncomfortable with children. Hmm. So you need to have, uh, you need to pick the right staff for the right job. Yeah, same as Sherway uh, said, is uh, equipment like refraction is very important, number one. Number two is uh, excellent measurement. I mean, I would probably would say this, it would become like a standard now. Become mm -hmm. when we talk about myopia management, or even now will be a lot of people will talk about is it become a standard. You have to measure every single kid when they come in uh, for the axial length and see what the size of the eyeball is like. Then we can talk to the parents about what the mm -hmm. kids future risk. Okay, if we the future risk. Okay, about what's going to happen and like uh, like the setup of the practice is also important. Make sure. Uh, you don't have any sharp tables or uh, toys in there and make sure your room is uh, breakable. Kid, or, kid friendly. <laughs> or kids friendly, breakable, not unbreakable. Yeah. Make sure the kids won't damage your, 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 your furniture easily. Yeah, that is something that you have to prepare. Otherwise you will scream about oh, the kids come and break my family scope or my nice toys or my nice uh, chair. Now there's one device in our field that has a pretty cool name, the Myopia Master. Um, so I was just curious if either of you use this device to assess or screen patients. I basically use it for 
basically every single one now. Every single kid's coming as well. Definitely do it. And I also will do on some adults as well, especially the kids with myopia and also measure the parents' eye size. So the parents can have some understanding about mm. the prescription, the size and the kids, uh, how relevant they are. And especially the high myopia parents, um, they can see the size of the eyeball and they worry about the size of the eyeball and they worry about the kids when the kids become more myopic down the track. I think interestingly, uh, I, sub- I, I can only speak for, for my clinic, uh, pac- parents have become rather involved uh, in the myopia management, which I think is very important. Yeah. Uh, and what rather I would say it surprises me is more often than not now, parents are able, they would ask, has the myopia increased? And then the next question is, has the length of the eye increased? Hmm. So that for me is one step up. It's either that we've explained it so well, so that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the other, so therefore the parents are realizing the importance of myopia management and axial length management. Uh, and the other thing is that they're actually getting involved in that process now. So the parents know a bit more axial length now. So I'd like to think that we've done a good job. <laughs> I think it's one thing is like Cheryl said about optometry is more on the front line. That's I think I encourage most optometrists is when we communicate about myopia, we just not talk about just diopters, the D. We have to talk about the MM, the excellent the millimeters as well so we know every single millimeters means a lot not now probably mm. we talk about what happens in the future when they're 18 or 21 mm. yeah i think that's something that we have to do a lot of work uh, in the early stage yeah i mean i guess part of this is also still educating on a very high level um optometrists and ophthalmologists and it seems like you know, devices like the Myopia Master can go very deep in analysis. So I'm curious, you know, in terms of, you know, these high level devices, what are the advantages of using those, um, you know, for diagnostic purposes on a, on a deeper level? I think deeper level for me is uh, in early myop, so we can tell the parents how the kids at this stage, the size and the prescription, uh, matching with the age, for example, in the Asians, Asian populations of how they match and look at the future risks about if we don't manage it, or especially those people who are myopic, um, some kids myopic, we have to do a bit more early interventions to prevent them become more myopic and the eyesight try to slow down the axial length growth. We possible would love to stop, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Stop them, but they still grow taller, but the eyeball didn't change much. This is our, our deal dreams to, to make it happen. So, and also, like I said before, like this, like a Maupi master is also have a lot of good features for me to communicate with the parents and tell them how the kids uh, happening. I mean, what happening means is how our treatment plans are working or not working. So any modification we need to do and also help us to understand about the kid lifestyle as well. I think there are a lot of things that give us a lot of good information, especially during the pandemic. We see there's a change uh, in Australia. If it's a pandemic time, we have the lockdown time. We see the size, excellent size change from my practice or my, my kids' eye change. But when the lockdown is, we mm. see everything stable. I think same in Singapore mm-hmm. as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think, yes. So, so your question is the deep part. My question is more the, I think for me, it's more the making uh, the optometrist job actually easier. Mm. Uh, the re- the, because to start off with, myopia control, or myopia management is a relatively new specialty. Yeah. So bringing, so introducing any new specialty or adding a new specialty to a practice is never easy because that means new education, bringing in more staff, being able to communicate with patients, educating the patients. And what the myopia master does is it simplifies the process. So it, it's, it sounds superficial, but it's actually deep. Because what it does is it makes the whole pathway simpler. And 
on the part, it's to be to be really honest. I think that the work of well, my work, the ophthalmologist's work, is rather much easier than the work for an optometrist because the patient comes in and the child has not seen any eye care practitioner before. And then the parent is told, your seven-year-old needs glasses, right? Mm. So is the, and many optometrists have asked me this before. How do you talk about myopia management without sounding pushy, without sounding like you're upselling, right? Are you, what are you trying to do? You're trying to sell me expensive glasses or contact lenses. And so why should I trust you? I'm going mm. to go to somebody else. So by the time they come to me, I've got a mighty easy job because I'm just confirming that Oliver said you're myopic. Oh yeah, you're myopic. He's right, right? And then the, the patient says, so what, what should I do? Well, then the doctor seems to know everything, but that it's not true. I'm just supporting what he, what he said. So hmm. the myopic master supports what the optometrist says in numbers. Hmm. So the, you know, it, it's with a graph, you know, somehow you've managed to present myopia in a much more objective way. So I think it really helps the optometrist. It's not some fuzzy idea. It's something that the patients can, the pa parents rather of the child can visualize, yeah. right? And so they love that. People like to see pictures. They like to see images. They see a graph and it's like, wow, this is real. This is not something that is a dream, right? This is real. And also with the follow-up of the progression, when the parents see this line, they can, they go, has it stabilized? Has it stabilized? It's the first question. Oh my God. It's like, you know, I tell them often, I'm going to put you out of misery. I'm going to tell you you've done well. This is not Miss Universe. We, we tell you straight away who's won. Okay. There's right. no like drum roll and everybody panics. Right. So I think this might, that's where this myopia master comes in. It's not, it's not earth shaking i'm being very honest it's not earth shaking in like oh my god we have come up with with something phenomenal what we've done is to put two we've, we've basically put a microwave and an oven together we've minimized mm. the need for space which is what we all need in some countries more than others in 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 the shop or in a clinic so we packed the two together we're able to tell the parents this is your refraction this is your axial length, look at this piece of paper, let me draw you, let, look at the graph. Mm. And so I think that's where the strength yeah. of this machine is because we could measure the axial length and we could measure the prescription in any other machine. So I'm being very, very practical here, but it's like buying a thermomix, right? Everything is just in one. So mm. it makes it easier for everybody. I think there's also help us to uh, confirm or reassure the parents about the option, the treatment options, the, or the management options that we choose together for the patient or for the kids are mm -hmm. correct. And if there's any changes, mm -hmm. we know how we can modify and do much better for the kids yeah, the managing things together. So they're like a, a optometrists and ophthalmologists, um, we are working together for our kids' future. Now, moving along to our final topic of the day, uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about myopia management options. You know, so we're moving from diagnostics to how to choose the right treatment. So mm -hmm. first of all, uh, Oliver, what factors would you consider when prescribing myopia treatment? I think a lot of factors is like age of the kids and the prescriptions as well. And uh, that's just a lot of, these are the factors we need to consider. I mean, uh, in my practice, I do uh, uh, soft contact lenses, I do glasses, I do ortho K, and also we use, uh, also we incorporate with the atropine together. So this is depends on what the needs of the kids and all the conditions as well. So um, most of the time, if the kids are more in the low mouth, I mean, the early mouth, uh, we will uh, mostly we use a soft contact lens, for example, in my site. And also like uh, some specific, uh, mouth specific glasses in the early stage. 
And once they are getting older, they might want a bit more different lifestyle and they will change off with keratology. And some parents even, they just come straight, they just want off the keratology. But we need to examine the kids with all the right tools, the equipment to check the cornea, all the conditions and the capability of the kids can handle lenses before we, we, we decide whether, for example, like ortho case is a suitable right choice for the kids. There are a lot of things that we need to spend more consultations, understanding uh, about the kids' behavior and the parent expectation before we decide which one. I mean, there are a lot of things that legal, like we said before, like a communication, we need to build a trust, not just for the kids, mm -hmm. also the parents, because we're going to manage the kids, um, maybe the next, for example, kids seven years of age coming from RP management, we can look up the kids for what, uh, probably 11, 12, 15 years mm -hmm. yeah, to go to university. I mean, there's a lifelong, uh, like uh, what I would say is a like lifelong commitment and commitment for the ECP in managing RP, not, not just a one or two years Bye bye. That's so simple thing. It's like commitment. That's why when doing Maupi a Maupi management, it's like a commitment uh, with the kids that mm -mm. we need to commit to them and see them regularly. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's like a marriage as well. We have to commit it <laughs> with full heart and with passions and love and care for the kids. So this is something that will bring a lot of beauties and sweetness because, like, uh, I've seen a lot of my patients now got married. And the kids, and even I got a fair bit of uh, invitation for the wedding as well, okay, uh, to, to, to witness the, the, the sweetness as well. And uh, like before I come, a young lady come in and just show me the hand. I said, oh, you got engaged, <laughs> okay? So I mean, so sweet, they come and, and show and share the happiness, yeah. What about you, Cheryl? What about your well, husband? I see them from small. I have, a, I have a few photos where you see them when they're four. And usually yeah. they stop. Uh, I see every child from four years old. Uh, reason being that uh, either we sadly would have picked up that the child is already myopic. Uh, but more often than not, at four, at five years old, they are not myopic. But mm. that's actually the best time to talk about prevention. Uh, what I think uh, I'm seeing a lot of is when they're seven or eight years old to find that they are myopic. But the mm. reason is, again, a lifestyle problem because they were not told when they were four or five, or the parents were not told mm. rather, to say, hey, let's look at some things we should be doing every day, which would be, say, go outside and play in the sunshine, mm -hmm. uh, a minimum of two hours a day, because that, that research has been very strong. If the child is not myopic, a two-hour sunshine time outdoors makes a huge difference. Mm. But that difference we do not see once the child is myopic. Interesting. So that's why I want to see the children early. So I see them from four years old. We talk about sunshine time and we talk about what hobbies they should have, and also near time versus far time. So mm. it's not about whether the iPad is worse or better than a book. They are no better. They're near. Anything that is far is better for the eyes. So many patients don't, or many parents don't realize that the TV at a distance is better than Lego. So intellectual time and eye time is not the same thing, right? Doesn't mean that that reading is any better than an iPad. So that's what most parents think. And Lego must be better than watching YouTube. But depends whether the YouTube is on an iPad or whether the YouTube is on a, a screen far, far away. Um, so I think these are the things that I want to start from very young. So that's four years old. And then we see them, if the child is not myopic, then I would see them every year. I think the same is for me is not just outdoor time. Um, because I, I, I encourage the parents, is the parent always say, hey, son, go out, play more, play more, play more soccer, isn't it? But I always tell the parent is not just your kid. I love have a family time together. Yes. It's a family time to go do outdoor activities together. I think there's something that as uh, optometrists or from all just, Sometimes we want the parents to 
to do it together, like old activity. You can't say the girl, I can't go, go do a soccer ball and the father just playing like mobile phone. Oh yeah, I'll go, are you, oh, you score one, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's something we, we, we can encourage, educate the parents is get involvement with the mobile management by changing lifestyle, not just the kids, it's together. So tell the parents, just don't spend too much time on the phone. Mm-hmm. Okay, Just spend more time with the kids outdoor. Even shopping yeah. is good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, along the the this the COVID time has also been a time of that That's we've true. had a bit more time to reflect. Mm. Uh, I've had a bit, I've had a bit more time to do things that I wanted to do, uh, and one of the ways that uh, following on what Oliver said, which is getting the parents uh, to be involved in this myopia management, what I've done. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I've start. I've I've created my own website. So so I created it myself. It's called theeyeclinic.com.sg, and it's a conversation with the parents. So in other words, I'm talking to the parent. I share my anxieties, right? And I've said that because they come into the room and they share everything with me. So right. I, I feel right. that me too. I I should do the same. So the, the, one of the ways, because I only see the patients once every three months, but what is important is that time in between each follow-up. So even with the clinic's Facebook, it's very personal. So when I, Pascal and I, you know Pascal, my husband, when we mm-hmm. take Mark out to play football, when he's out rolling, if this is a weekly, at least once a week, we would put something there. And the reason is to jolt the parents into saying, hey, it's Wednesday, let's talk about playing some football together with the kid. So we're trying to jolt this process by constantly reminding them. And it's not just saying, you go do it. So I use the family as a way to, well, it's also good for us because now we're duty bound to do the same. And the other thing is even say, I would source for free. So the whole point is that it should be free and accessible to everybody. Audiobooks. Because audiobooks is also a fantastic way for eye breaks for myopia control. Because if the question is, what do you what do they do for their far time? Surely you're not going to ask the child to look out of the window and count the number of birds, right? So we right, have to right. use this time well. So whether it's you know giving them ideas to what they could do at home. So in Asia, we don't have the the privilege, if you like, of big outdoor spaces. So what can we do in the house that would be an eye break? So it could be skipping rope. It could be kicking a football around. We even play ping pong, right, on the floor. We have to come up with ideas to to make the eye break time a little bit more fun. Because to be honest, children and adults were not very dissimilar. If you left us sitting around with nothing better to do, we would reach out for a handphone as well. So it would be unfair to expect the child to be a better version of ourselves. And you know, Cheryl, another it's... major issue in this space is patient compliance. We know we, we mm. run up time and time again into this issue. And I was wondering whether, for example, my site um, is a solution to this. Um, and over to you, Oliver. I think that my site is... My, my my experience in fitting my site probably over ten years from my experience is, is a product that if you use it it work <laughs> it work okay it basically work on most of the kids in my practice most of the kids uh, they are really good correlation in terms of managing the diopter changes and the axial length changes so uh, compliance is one thing very important I think compliance is very important. Um, I encourage all the kids, and most of my kids is wear about probably 10 hours at least a day. And most of my kids are at least six days a week. Some of them are like a, a cons- I mean, full-time wear like seven days. And so far the results are very really mm-hmm. promising and I, I really enjoy the result that the product can deliver to my Maupi kids since they were young. And I'm really, really excited. Uh, I, I had the early access back in 10 years ago for this product. And yeah, how about you, Cheryl? I think compliance uh, applies to applies to all things, whether it's my sight, uh, wearing glasses, because even if they were to wear glasses, they should be wearing it all the time. Uh, uh, whether it's atropine use, whether it's compliance with good 
habits, right? Mm. So it's a combination of all things. Uh, I would say that if we had to compare my site, if we're talking about compliance, there will be a group of patients to, of, of, of children that's, yeah, who would not wear their glasses for a variety of reasons. It could be aesthetics. Yeah. It could be for sports that it's just so uncomfortable. I mean, especially in Asia where half the time you're sweating away and the glasses slips off your nose. So <laughs> they would just play tennis without seeing properly. I've always half wondered, uh, you know, you maybe explains why we're not such good tennis players, right? Yeah. So the compliance would be more that because the child can see better, they would wear it, mm. right? Uh, more that, I think, than, than anything else. Well, being and in the perhaps- editorial realm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cheryl. No, and it's and some children would find it more comfortable than wearing um, an ortho K lens because it's a soft lens. It's just more. It's easier during the time of insertion and removal of the contact lens. So that might encourage the child to want to wear this my sight um, regularly. I think a lot of safety is a reason as well. I mean, a lot of parents they. They, they did my practice. They said, no, oh, no, oh, okay, no, no, no. Because I said, why? I said, oh, I worry about the infections, all the problems mm-hmm. they heard from other friends and not fitting well. That's because my sister did this uh, disposable lenses. A lot of my parents, they, they really prefer daily disposal, like at my side compared to ortho okay, because safety is an issue. So from I think from my experience for the last 10 years, I would say I do not have any have any major issues which is due to my sight. Okay. And there may be some kids, not the lens issue, more probably the handling, the, the hygiene issue get a bit mild infection, but definitely not due to the contact lenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was gonna say earlier that uh, you know, as publishers, we should note that my site is the only FDA approved product for myopia control and has the longest clinical trial for myopia management. And I'd really be curious though, you know, how do the MySight contact lenses slow the progression of myopia, you know, for our audience? They, I'm sure, sure they'd love to know. I shared with you guys before is that there are strong correlations between the doctors and the, uh, the millimeters. I mean, my clinical experience, uh, because I've been doing biometry for, for my myopic patients, uh, myopia management patients or kids uh, for over probably now for 17, 18 years now. So I, I see a strong correlations in between the management in slowing down diopter, diopters and other millimeter. So this is something I, I can reassure my patients, this product is work as long as you use it. <laughs> if you don't use it, it's not working. <laughs> so make sure your kids wear the lenses if possible, uh, as long as possible, like 10 hours, 12 hours, if you can wear seven days a week would be the best. I, I want the kid to have the maximum opportunity uh, to control and manage the myopia. That is something I encourage the parents about, uh, especially in my side. And by the way, uh, Oliver, how does the dual focus optical design work of that my sight device? I think that's like the, he, they, they, they just, probably we know that the dual focal, like the center part is more is the, for the distant corrections. Okay. okay. And okay. The, the other, the, the, the plus part is for the control part. They bring the image. Sometimes we just make it simple to explain to parents. They bring the image from the back of the retina in front of the retina. So the eyes know, hey, the image is in front, not behind. So you don't have to chase the image at the back. So the eye size will slow down in progressions. So at the same time with the balloon analogy <laughs> and the myopia master or the axial length or the information the parent present the parent, the parent understands, oh, this is how it helped to slow down the eye side, which means they can sort out the, the, the prescription diopter changes. So, so what it is, is uh, I, I had to get my head around this as well, right? Yeah. Because all this yeah. myopia control is, it's, it's, it's new. Yeah. So largely the contact lens, if we imagine it's round. Yeah. And the, how it's designed is it's basically made of concentric circles moving from the center outwards. 
So the central part that if you imagine is what we're looking, what we, when we look at something straight in front of us, that part would be perfectly focused. Then a little bit away from the central bit is what we call the area of defocus. Focus, yeah. So that means it's not completely clear. Mm. And then mm. the next ring is clear again. And then the, the, the ring after that is defocused. So clear, blur, clear, blur, clear, blur, right? So this whole, the principle of it is that the retina needs to be focused in some parts or maybe a percentage of some part of the retina needs to be focused. Right. And some part of it needs to be defocused. So it's, 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 it's rather interesting how this all came about, but that's basically the principle of it. So for that same reason, if I have tried my sight myself, so if you were to put a my sight in one eye and you put a normal contact lens in the other eye and you kind of cover one eye and you look, it is not as sharp and clear as a normal contact lens. Mm. There is some blurriness, but that is exactly how it should be in order to prevent the eye from elongating or getting more myopic, as it were. Uh, so that's really the principle of my sight. And yesterday when we were, it's, it's going to sound a little bit, um, what is that word? Kitsch kitsch, but mm -hmm. it's like dual purpose because it helps you see better. It also controls the myopia, so it's dual purpose because it's dual focus, focus. right? So this is the only time you're allowed to two time. Do you pay in this? Yeah, he says I should. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Cheryl, um, we talked about axial length a little bit earlier, but really what is the correlation of axial length to refractive control and how does my site address that in particular? And because we knew you were going to ask that, we've actually done some research into this. Okay. So okay. How, how it's been, so the study is actually pretty long. It's a three year study, because it would be impossible to remember all these tiny numbers, but I can actually tell you. So there's a, it's a very good correlation with, if the patient is compliant, right? With, uh, with my site, we're talking about a 59% control of the myopia compared with a population that just wears a, a regular contact lens or glasses. And it's very well correlated with um, preventing that growth, it's actually really well correlated. So 59% in reduction in myopia control, and it's a 52% in reduction of extension equipment. of the axial length. So what, what we're saying is that the correlation between the prevention of myopia control, or rather, let's rewind that, the correlation with the progression of myopia and the correlation with the progression of the axial length is very, very good. Which then goes back to why it's important to measure both the prescription, which is the myopia, as well as the axial length, because they both need to be correlated extremely well. I've got just a few questions left and then we're gonna take some audience uh, Q&A. But you know, over to Oliver, what are some tips for counseling young patients and their parents? For example, inserting the contact lenses, remembering to remove them at night, adherence, you know, these types of things. I think for the for, for younger kids, for really young kids, some really young, like a five and six, okay, seven, sometimes they might not be able to do it by themselves. As some can, I have some five years of age, they can do the mindset really comfortably. So uh we need to start from putting some, as and put some uh, like, a, like a lubricant on the finger, okay? And try to 
help them to touch eye, get them the sensation, the feeling. So when they know the feeling is not hurting, it's some touching the sensation, mm -hmm. they will start getting used to it. So uh, then teach a parent, the younger one, okay, like a six or seven years age, sometimes the parents don't want the kids to wear them, the parents will help them. We will teach the parent how to do it. And most of the time we would teach the kids after about two or three weeks, we teach a cow to remove themselves. Mm. Okay. We remove themselves. I said, this is something you need to do every night. <laughs> so the kids are really good in taking the lenses out now. For most of my kids of a six, seven age, they can really take it out. Definitely some, they can do it by themselves. And I think initially consultations is the sensation. Make sure they understand the sensation. Some kids might be find a bit difficult to uh, put the drops here to touch the eyes. And I tell them, let's try this, put the lubricants on the finger, <laughs> I mean, in, in the hand, not the finger, the hand, and then you try to touch it open Ooh, and then yes. close and they feel the drops. Uh -huh. And most of the kids, they said, I can handle this with the drops in here. Mm -hmm. I open, touch, blink, and they feel the drop in the eye. And this also the tips that also help some of the kids when doing the low, mm -hmm. low dose of atrophy because mm -hmm. the kids scared the parents to drop it. I said, hey, put one drop here, open, touch, close, bang, the drops go in. I think this is the tips that I've been doing the last, probably about mm -hmm. the last two years about these this tips to, to the kids. That mm -hmm. All kids can handle the drops really easily and the sensation is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how about you, Cheryl? So I'm very fortunate because I have, um, I have very well-trained optometrists <laughs> who themselves wear uh, contract lenses. They wear the ortho case. So they're, they're excellent with, with the children. So I leave that very much to them. Final question from me for today. Uh, what are some benefits to the MySight lenses compared to other contact lenses, uh, ortho-K lenses, you know, et cetera? I think probably for me, the, when they compare, it's probably the, uh, the safety. Okay, well, we know the safety. It is really great from my uh, clinical experience and also from the my side, the Cooper Vision of the study come up, the lens are really safe. And also, uh, it's, it's the efficacy is really great. And I knew they're going to have the seven year studies going to release. And, and I have prefer I can just have a look of this. Okay. And um, they, the four, seven years is the, the rebounds, okay? When you stop under seven years, the rebounds basically is minimal or maybe zero, okay? And I think this is like a lifestyle, a more the preference they want to choose. And I would say the K and other options also have the benefits and pros and cons. But most of the parents are more concerned about the safety. I think most of the parents mm -hmm. are more concerned about safety, uh, is the priority number one. Number two is the efficacy. But we knew the 60 studies uh, published as very great. And also from my clinic, my clinical experience, my data, and I, 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 I find really, really great product. I, I have no hesitation if the kids want soft contact lenses in male pain management, this is the product, I my first choice. Plus I, we knew this is FDA approved product. That's reassure the parent, this product is safe. Mm -mm. Okay. I, I, so in, in my practice, I think there are various users, uh, not just the one for the my site. Uh, if we were to compare, like your question was, what does it compare with the other lenses? I think very simplistically, if any child wants to wear a contact lens, example for sports, for yeah. me, it yeah. would make no sense at all to wear a, a normal single vision contact lens. So for me, that, that would make absolutely no sense. So if it is a child with the risk of, of, of myopia progression, which is basically all kids, yeah, then they're better off wearing the my sight than the normal sighted single vision contact lens. So that I think we've determined. Then there's another set of children who do not want to wear contact lenses every day. There's some mm. children who wear late in the morning on certain days and they would say okay I'm going to put on a pair of glasses and I'm going to school so they could have glasses that would also control the myopia and they could alternate between my sight and the glasses so that gives them um, an option if you like that they cannot do with the ortho -K 
because with the ortho K, it's very ortho K is very much like wearing braces. So every they wear night. it every night. They have to wear it every night. And should they forget to wear it one night, if they were to put on their regular glasses, the glasses would be overpowered because mm. the, the cornea doesn't bounce back to completely normal just because we stopped wearing the ortho K for one night. Mm. So if we're talking about this, there's one group of children who would say, I want to wear my, my contact lenses four times a week when I have rugby, when I have tennis, but the rest of the time I'm going to wear glasses. So I'm very happy for this child to have my sight as one of their well weaponry, if they like. And of course, uh, the advantage of the MySight is that it's a daily disposable contact lens. So that means they save on money on buying products for cleaning. So that's a big advantage for many parents because the commitment financially is less. So they're quite willing to start off with a few boxes of MySight, unlike committing to something for a whole year. So that is, I think, uh, a good start. Uh, for for any family who decides that they want to embark on myopia control, it's a big it's a big daunting step because, like Oliver says, it's a commitment. So, but no one wants to plunge in thousands of dollars without knowing if this child would continue to use uh, contact lenses. Like, like what you Dr. Cheryl Lee said about the ortho kite, you just keep a night, and that the vision doesn't affect it. I've been mean, in the uh, clinical setting, sometimes we will give them a pair of glasses for that one day, one, two nights off. But the problem is, we explain to parents, not one or two days off, is we want to get the maximum corrections and the control effect. Mm -hmm. So for ortho characters, where are we encouraging to wear them basically every single night, okay, to get the maximum effect. But if we talk about, for example, like my site, and as long as you wear the lenses, the effect is there. <laughs> So the parents see the difference and understand you wear it, you got a contouring effect. Also, okay, you skip one night, two night, we might lose a little bit of the uh, clarity into the correction as well as the contouring effect. So we, we, we tell the parents about that's a compliance issue as well. Yeah. And guys, I've got to go to the questions. We've got them popping off. I um, feel like I've never seen so many questions. Uh, great. Well, we've got uh, pra Pratyush Dockel asking, what type of biometry machines do you prefer? And, you know, should it be non-contact or contact based like the IOL Master 700 or probe based? Any contact. thoughts there? Yeah. Non-contact. <laughs> Optical. I, I think if you're working with children, right? That's the, the first thing, because that, 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 that's what myopia control is about. It's got to be as pleasant as possible, as undaunting as possible. Uh, so definitely a non-contact. Definitely not contact for me. Because you don't want to put drops. Because if you were to do use something that is a contact, you would that you would have to put in a local anesthetic drop. So that just adds on more 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 work and more more fear, really. Plus, also is a operator dependent as well, isn't mm. it? It's a contact one, isn't it? You will find that if yeah. the if the operator is not really good, steady hand consistency, <laughs> we may have a variations. So non-contact ones are basically is very consistent. I mean, most of the machine can perform a good job in measuring it. And I think I want to make myopia control accessible to everybody. Yeah. We're not here to say, oh, you know, we should drive a Ferrari. I just want to get to, 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 to point B. Yeah, I want to make sure that the myopia is, is controlled. So if a practice uses a machine for measuring the axial length, they keep to the same machine. Mm. I think... So long as we can monitor progression, that's all I would ask for. We now, don't you guys are familiar with um, rapid fire sessions, and we've got so many questions here. I'm thinking I'm going to ask one question, and each of you can you know, just respond to uh, the question. Okay. I'll nominate well, the person to, to answer, and then it's like 30 seconds. Well, we'll the next one. This is going to be great. Why don't we just, why don't we just see who, who answers first? <laughs> All right, great, great. Okay, competition here. All right, Anonymous asked, what about the genetic component of myopia? I have many parents say my entire family wears glasses. I'll call it the genetics of lifestyle. 
Just because everybody in the family is fat does not mean it's due to the genetics. We should watch what they're eating. So if everyone in that family is academic, they love to read, they don't like to go outdoors to play, maybe we should address that. Genetics plays not a very big part. It's 20%. If we're looking at genetics of myopia, we're talking, or like a, a big genetic predisposition for myopia, we're talking about a very young child, we're saying two years old, with a myopia that's skyrocketing through the roof. We're not talking about a seven-year-old with a, a, a myopia of minus one. That is a distinct difference. So let's not blame someone else or our great grandparents for why we need glasses. We might have to blame the iPhone. I think ding, early ding, intervention, ding, 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 early ding. examination. Next. Is <laughs> Next. <laughs> Anonymous attendee says, post-pandemic, have you seen increased myopia cases in your clinical practice? For example, uh, online classes and less outdoor activities in kids must have contributed to this. How is your practice or your country addressing this? Yes, definitely, because we monitor the kids like uh, regularly, for example, uh, like exolane uh, 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 changes, uh, diopter changes, even those kids already under the management. We noticed during the pandemic time, the lockdown time, the changes in the exolane and the progressions. I think that's a pandemic lifestyle definitely affect a lot, a lot. So we need to encourage the kids to have more lifestyle changes. William Martin Gerber says, good day all. I have a 13 year old girl that saw me for the first time this week. No previous refraction history. Refraction is right, minus 2.5 diopters and six over six. Left minus 5.5 diopters and 612. Normal eye exam, normal topography, similar K values and axial lengths. How is this anisometropia possible given the similar K values and axial length? Thank you. I guess this is the quiz question. Similar K reading with same axial length? Is that uh, what he said? Similar K values and axial lengths, yeah. One, is it lenticular? Yeah. So that means, are we missing something in the, the eye that is minus 5.5? And 2.5. And Yeah, so is it, so is this a real axial length myopia? Same thing with adults, because we can have adults who are more myopic um, as they get older because a cataract forms, yeah. right? So I think we need to look into that. Two, uh, I will assume that the, the axial length was properly measured. I think that that, that must be something that we might uh, need to look into. Our third one is, should we even consider a cyclotegic refraction? Um, I, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I think not, what last thing is checking for the binocular vision, whether the kids that I mean, the teenagers have in the binocular vision, because it's a bit unlikely to have this really similar size and with different prescriptions by free doctors. But what I just remembered you said was the eye that has got the long, the higher myopia is also the eye that's seen 612, not 66. Am I correct, Matt? I believe so. The question has disappeared from my view. Okay, so that is something to, to we need to think about as well, because clearly this child is not seeing perfectly. So whether the refraction is a true value yeah. uh, of, of uh, whether the refraction is, is absolutely correct. Archana Kulkarni asks, can you update an IOL master to work as a myopia master? And second part of her question is, what is the earliest age or lowest refraction when you would start my site or atropine? Uh, no idea about IOL master from my side. Okay. Um, number two, my site, I'm comfortable to start with minus 050 because I have favorite with minus 050 uh, kits uh, to, to, to do it. Atropine depends on axial length changes and progression rate, how they compare to the age group as well. And that's just a, a lot of consideration factors to put atropine. I think uh, for me, I would say that there is no early time to start myopia management. Because if a child is myopic, it's a bit like saying the child, is the child going to be taller next year? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I have not seen a child who has stayed the same height for the next year. So that means if the eyeball is that length, 
it's terribly unlikely, or show me one, that the, that the length of the eye stays the same till next year. So we do need to start the myopia management as soon as possible. Yeah, there's no such thing as saying, today it's minus 0 0.5. Why don't we wait till it's minus 1.5? That's very, that. then we start. Yeah, so I and think there's no time to when we should start the atropine. With the my site, the consideration, of course, is that it does not co correct astigmatism. So we need to bear that in mind as well. So uh, great as it is, it's not something that, that would uh, apply to, to all, all kids because of the astigmatism. How does the MyoSmart glasses compare to my sight contact lenses with myopia control? Uh, another question from a, an anonymous attendee. Uh, this is a really good question to ask because, uh, like Cheryl said about my side lenses, when you put it on, basically for the eyeball ro rotations, where the clarity in the center, where the focus, wherever the eye rotate, the lens follow it. Okay, glasses. The major problem is like this. <laughs> okay, of <Or> this. <laughs> okay, so like the positioning, dispensing where the glasses is really important. Uh, the major problem for these two products is the dose, what we call the dose is how often, how many hours the kids can wear the glasses, put in the head, okay, and the contact lenses. I mean, these are the questions we need to be aware of the dosage between the hours they actually have it on the eye. And for the glasses, positions very important. Soft contact lenses, my side, bank, center. <laughs> Okay, I assume the fitting is right. Okay, always enter. So if we look at all this data, if they all, uh, they all should perform really similar. But in reality, we know, especially in Asia, it's too sweaty, glasses always drop down. <laughs> okay, so uh, that might be a problem if, uh, for like for example, like you, the the, the audience, the as our meal smart lenses, the position is very important. We want to achieve the optimal result positions. Those say it's just very important. And how if frequently you're asking, do you, mm -hmm. how frequently do you measure axial length? I'm going to override that, Cheryl. <laughs> yes, every Great. time we see the patient. How many? How okay. frequent? Yeah, every so time. Three every, so, so I guess it's as frequently as we would see the patient. So at every visit. May three monthly. Anonymous asks: Most of the myopes are not using their glasses for near work. What's your observation on this? And will that affect the myopia progression? Yes. Yes. And one, uh, there is another reason that I say that they should wear the glasses all the time. Uh, when a child sees not well for far, they tend to like to do things that are around them. Close up. And that makes the myopia worse. What I want is the child to look up away from his book and to be able to see something well in the distance. That will make him want to do things that is in the distance. If we look at adults, no different. When an adult becomes presbyopic, many actually stop reading as much. An anonymous attendee asks, until what age can we keep on working on myopia control? As long as it takes to stabilize the myopia, very much like the height, but it's been well shown that as a minimum, they should be taken care of till they're age 16. Tala Naka, well, I'm not gonna pronounce that last word. Uh, but is it true that long-term usage of ortho-K lenses can cause some corneal damage? If the lens fit properly, uh, if the lens fit properly, if you use the right uh, care maintenance product, uh, routine examinations, replacements routinely regularly, I think this is also nice and safe. I think with contact lenses, there are two things that I would pay a lot of attention to. One would be dry eyes and the other one is uh, prevention of infections. So with a dry eye, the thing that I, what I would do in the clinic is to make sure that they're on regular use of uh, uh, omega-3, specifically working for dry eyes, and two, prevention of infections. And the infections, finally, they don't come from 
the fingers, because largely we, we wash our hands before putting the, the, the contact lenses in. We have to make sure the cases are clean, the contact lenses are well maintained. And the other one that I do regularly every six months for my patients uh, is Blefex. So what it does is it, it clears off the bugs, if you like, from the dirty eyelashes, because that's where the infections come from. Most of the time of this eyelid or dry eye problem are happening in the teenage. So one tips for the uh, our, our audience is kids younger primary school, they have less problem with the lead hygiene or bath writers issue. When they go to teenage, when they go to high school, we have to make sure look carefully about the eyelid, eyelashes. This is really important. That's uh that's have to keep annoying them about how dirty the eyelashes. It takes them for to annoy them, isn't it? <laughs> Well, guys, due to our time constraints, we're going to wrap up the uh, Q&A now. Uh, that was a great job, this rapid fire session. So I congratulate both of you for those fast and accurate answers. Uh, but overall, I'd want to thank both Cheryl and Oliver for this awesome, awesome discussion today. Uh, marvelous, marvelous. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. See you. <laughs> See you later. And I want to say thanks to everyone for joining empowering your practice through myopia management. We'll be doing three more such webinars in the near future, all supported by both Oculus and CooperVision. Be sure to stay tuned as we roll those out. Until then, stay focused and see you next time. Bye. <laughs>